God of my salvation. And we'll remain seated at this point to sing stanzas one, three, and four only. Our God calls us to worship with these words from Psalm 125. Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be moved, but abides forever. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people from this time forth and forever. Shall we bow in a moment of silent prayer and prepare our hearts for worship? Number 267 is our opening hymn of praise to our God, All Who With Heart Confiding. It's based on Psalm 125, from which we heard our call to worship. Number 267, we rise to sing the three stanzas.
Congregation loved by the Lord, receive his greeting. Grace and peace to you from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. At this time, we continue to confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed, but this afternoon set to song. And so if you would turn into the uh, back cover of your blue salt hymnal, uh, we'll be singing version number one of the Apostles' Creed, and we'll be singing it to the tune of Psalter Hymnal number 474. Please turn with me to Psalm 46 in your Bibles. Psalm 46. If you're visiting with us as a congregation, we have been reading through the Old Testament Psalms, and this afternoon we arrive at Psalm 46. A very familiar psalm which has brought comfort to God's people throughout the church age. Psalm 46 is entitled to the chief musician. It is a psalm of the sons of Korah, a song for Alamoth. And the psalmist pens these words under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear, even though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though its waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling. There is a river whose stream shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her just at the break of dawn. The nations raged, the kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice, the earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. 
Come, behold the works of the Lord, who has made desolations in the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariot in the fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. And in response, let us turn in our hymnals to a versification of Psalm 46, number 85. Number 85 in our blue salt hymnals, God is our refuge and our strength. And these uh, words were uh, penned by Martin Luther, as you see at the very top. And let us remain seated to sing the three stanzas. Just before we go to our congregational prayer, one announcement, a sad announcement. Um, for many of you, uh, we know uh, Fred Martina, who was a, actually a member here for, I would say, close to two years. Um, he's moved on, and he uh, became a member of the Protestant Reformed Church in Lacombe. We just received news that he passed away this morning, and uh, so we want to keep uh, the, his relatives in our prayers. Uh, we don't have any information about funeral at this point. We just got uh, word of it this afternoon there. So um, you know, if you would contact a relative or, or maybe the Protestant Reformed Church, you might be able to get some more details about the funeral this week, I'm sure. Let us go to our Father in heaven in prayer. Our God and Father, indeed, you are our refuge and our strength, our ever-present help in trouble. We thank you that you have made yourself known to us by speaking to us in your word, Indeed, Father, we have the creation all around us which shouts aloud of your glory, and yet you know that being fallen, uh, the creation itself is not enough, uh, that we would misinterpret the creation, just as so many still do today, and this seems to be increasing. We look around us at the glorious creation, and men say evolution, and millions and billions of years that uh, things just came into being by chance by some kind of a big bang where nothing became something. 
We thank you that you have given us your word that we may know you, the one who called all things into being, the one who sustains all things by your power. And we thank you that you have called us into your house to worship you a second time this day, that you have uh, very clearly proclaimed in your word that we are to come into your presence with singing, we are to shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation, we are to come before you with thanksgiving in our hearts, to shout joyfully to you with psalms, and to recognize that you are God, that you are the great God, the great King above all gods, to, con to confess in our hearts and with our mouths that in your hand are the deep places of the earth, that the heights of the hills are yours as well. The sea is yours, for you made it, and your hands formed the dry ground. And so we come indeed to worship and bow down, to kneel before the Lord, our Maker, confessing that you are our God and we are the people of your pasture and the sheep of your hand. We praise you, Father, for you are great and you are greatly to be praised. You are to be feared above all gods. Indeed, all the so-called gods of the peoples are but from the foolish minds of men. They are the product of the sinful hearts of men, which is a manufacturer of idols. But you, the Lord, our God, you are the one who made, made the heavens and the earth. And honor and majesty belong to you alone. Strength and beauty are yours alone. We thank you, Father, for the gift of worship, that we may gather to join our hearts and voices together to confess you, to praise you, and to be blessed by worship, that we may be strengthened and edified in our faith as we prepare to go back into the week again, a week of busyness and fulfilling our responsibilities. We thank you that we may have the Bible read uh, freely um, in, uh, in this country yet. We thank you that in the Bible you have revealed yourself and indeed your plan of salvation from its very beginning to its very end, how you elected us before the world was created out of a fallen human race and in your time you gave us the gift of faith enabling us to believe in the Savior the Lord Jesus Christ you have continued to to bless us that uh, we may stand fast in our faith preserving us so that we persevere until you bring us to the glory that you have already planned for us when Eden will be restored when we will rejoice in your presence when all aging and sickness and disease and sorrows and tears will be wiped away and all things will be made new in the meantime father help us to be growing in our knowledge of you in our knowledge of the holy scriptures bless us with your holy spirit and help us to pray and help us to pray well help us that we may seek after the things that you desire us to seek for and uh, the things that would uh, give us true spiritual growth we pray father uh, your blessing upon us this afternoon as we listen to another explanation of a part of the perseverance of the saints in the canons of the of dort we thank you for these creeds and confessions that we may confess or sing them and also uh, have either questions and answers or confessions before us that we may know what the bible teaches we pray that as we listen to this explanation this afternoon that it may be once again an encouragement to our hearts uh, pointing us again to your faithfulness and your goodness and the surety of the salvation of those whom you have chosen father this afternoon we also pray for the family of fred martina as we have received the sad news that you have called him out of this life father we pray that you would bless the family and relatives as a funeral will now be planned and the church community there in lacombe we pray that all things may go well and uh, once again father we thank you for the encouragement that uh, such news is to all our hearts that those who die in the Lord Jesus Christ as believers most certainly go to be with you. Father, we pray that you would uh, help us as a congregation to continue to pray and to seek after uh, our a growth in our relationship with Jesus Christ. We pray that as we worship, that we may see Christ and hear Christ and know Christ. We pray that as we read our Bibles, as we attend Bible studies, as we send our children to Christian schools, that they too may uh, hear everything in conformance with your word. As uh, we um, participate in church education classes, 
we pray, Father, your blessing upon these things that more and more we may know Christ and the richness and the depth of his love for us and the perfection of his salvation. Bless us with spiritual growth, we pray. And bless us also, Father, with numerical growth as a congregation as we continue to, to, to uh, make efforts toward reaching out in the community to those who do not know you. We pray that you would bless us, that we may have hearts of uh, evangelism, that we may have hearts that, uh, that, that uh, yearn after and, and uh, sorrow after those who live outside of Christ and who live in blindness and darkness and who are dead even while they live apart from Christ. We pray that we may pray for and seek after opportunities to, to uh, witness to others, to tell them about the love of Christ and about the perfect Savior uh, in whom we trust and in whom is our hope. Help us as a congregation to be a light in this community that in a world of great darkness, in a world that seems obsessed with immorality and death, that uh, we may show that we belong to the kingdom of light, to the God of holiness, the God who calls us to uh, be holy even as he is holy. Father, we pray your blessing as we exist as Christians in this world as well, as we uh, hear of tensions that are increasing against Christianity. We were recently informed by ARPA of the uh, case with Trinity Western. Uh, we hear that things have uh, taken a, a bad turn there again um, with uh, ministers pulling back their support. We pray that you would uh, bless us as Christians as we stand in the midst of a uh, spiritual battle that is going on today uh, with, with uh, liberalism and uh, worldliness and secularism, humanism on, on the one side um, and, uh, and, and, and true Christianity standing against the rest. We pray that you would help us to stand fast, to stand strong, to hold fast to our faith, not to grow cold in any way, not to be uh, uh, unconcerned in any way, not to become lazy or apathetic in any way, but to continue, Father, to lift up high the cross of Christ and the truth of the Holy Scriptures, even against hostility, uh, maybe even violence in, the times to, in times to come. We pray in this regard, Father, for our persecuted brethren all across the world. We pray for people in uh, Middle, uh, West, Middle Eastern countries uh, like Iraq and Iran and Syria, uh, various uh, surrounding areas, uh, Africa and China, where there is hostility and hatred against Christians, North Korea. Father, we think of the Ukraine as well, as the voices, voice of the martyrs report uh, escalating frequency of uh, attacks being made against Christians. Uh, which who, are, who reside uh, in Ukraine, uh, persecution and hatred of evangelicals, abductions, beatings, torture, threats of execution. Uh, we pray for our oppressed brethren in Ukraine as they experience mounting insecurity and persecution. We pray for pastors and church leaders within these regions, and for missionaries and evangelists in these areas. And we pray for all the followers of Christ that they would continue to so let their lights shine before men that they would see their good deeds and glorify our Father who is in heaven. We pray, Heavenly Father, for those who are in our midst with child. Uh, we thank you for the, for the births. We thank you for conceptions in our midst. We also pray that you would bless mothers and their, the children they carry, the covenant children that they bear. We pray that you would watch over them and bless them that uh, through their time, all things will go well, and when the time comes, that there will be safe deliveries and healthy children. Bless, uh, especially, Father, our young parents as well, uh, the, either those who are expecting or those who have uh, recently been blessed with young children. Give to them the health and strength that they need from day to day. Uh, uh, we pray that you would grant them enough sleep and enough time in the day to get all that they need to get done, and we pray that uh, they may receive support from friends and, fa and family and from the church family in every way and that we would keep uh, each other in our prayers. Father, we also pray for our singles this afternoon, uh, for growth in their faith, that they, would have, uh, that they would be growing in their walk with you, uh, growing in their trust, that, uh, that they may believe and truly confess in their hearts that, uh, that your will uh, be done in their lives. And we pray that even now that you would prepare them, as even now you are preparing their future spouses to be faithful husbands and wives. And so, we, Father, we pray for our uh, for our young people, our singles, um, who perhaps are thinking of, uh, of getting married and having a family in, in times to come, that you would bring into their path uh, the ones that you have chosen for them and uh, those indeed who will help them to grow in their faith and grow closer to you. 
and uh, by whom, uh, and, and, uh, and that they will help to grow as well. We pray, bless us in this hour as we worship you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Congregation, please turn with me for our scripture reading to Psalm 27. Looking this afternoon at a third installment in uh, the Canons of Dort, Article 5, on the perseverance of the saints. And we're looking at, once again, at how the Lord indeed preserves us so that we persevere, so that we hold fast in our faith. And so for our scripture background reading, we'd like to read Psalm 27, which is the Psalm of David. And David writes these words under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked came against me to eat up my flesh, my enemies and foes, they stumbled and fell. Though an army may encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. The war may rise against me. In this I will be confident. One thing I have desired of the Lord, that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret place of his tabernacle he shall hide me. He shall set me high upon a rock. And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. Therefore I will offer sacrifices of joy in his tabernacle. I will sing, yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice. Have mercy also upon me and answer me. When you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face, Lord, I will seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my help. Do not leave me nor forsake me, O God of my salvation. When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take care of me. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me in a smooth path because of my enemies. Do not deliver me to the will of my adversaries. For false witnesses have risen against me, and such as breathe out violence. I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Our song of preparation is number 48, which is a versification of Psalm 27. Number 48, Jehovah is my light. We rise to sing the first three stanzas only of number 48. Please also turn with me in the back of the Blue Psalter Hymnal to page 111. Page 111 in the back of the Psalter Hymnal. 
we'll be looking this afternoon at articles 9 through 11. So actually, page one, starting at page 110 to 111. The Canons of Dort, fifth head of doctrine on the perseverance of the saints, articles 9 through 11. On page 110 to 111. And this is our confession. Of this preservation of the elect to salvation, and of their perseverance in the faith, true believers themselves may and do obtain assurance according to the measure of their faith, whereby they surely believe that they are and ever will continue true and living members of the church, and that they have the forgiveness of sins and life eternal. Article 10, this assurance, however, is not produced by any peculiar revelation contrary to or independent of the word of God, but springs from faith in God's promises, which he has most abundantly revealed in his word for our comfort, from the testimony of the Holy Spirit, witnessing with our spirit that we are children and heirs of God, and lastly, from a serious and holy desire to preserve a good conscience and to perform good works. And if the elect of God were deprived of this solid comfort, that they shall finally obtain the victory, and of this infallible pledge of eternal glory, they would be, of all men, the most miserable. Article 11, the scripture moreover testifies that believers in this life have to struggle with various carnal doubts, and that under grievous temptations, they do not always feel this full assurance of faith and certainty of persevering. But God, who is the Father of all consolation, does not suffer them to be tempted above that they are able, but will, with the temptation, make also the way of escape, that they may be able to endure it, and by the Holy Spirit again inspires them with the comfortable assurance of persevering. Congregation of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we've been looking at this fifth head of doctrine, the perseverance of the saints, and we have said that this refers to that gracious work of God by His Holy Spirit, whereby He preserves us so that we persevere in the faith to the very end. And drawing from Scripture, we have looked at how comforting this is for the believer. And we've confessed that if the Lord left us to finish the race on our own, we would have no hope of salvation whatsoever. We ourselves would lose interest. We would become discouraged. We would become impatient along the way. And we would certainly be lost. We would be led astray by the attractions of this world if God was not holding on to us, guiding us, and guarding us as our great shepherd. The devil would make short work of us. And so it's really a blessing and great relief that the God of our salvation continues to hold on to us lest we surely perish. And if we are familiar at all with the God of the Bible, we know that it could be no other way. That is the very nature of our God. He is ever faithful. He brings to completion what he begins. He will allow none of his elect to be snatched away from him or allow them to wander away. He is the good shepherd who seeks and keeps his sheep. And yet, how can we be sure? How can we be sure of God's continued love to us? Because after all, we are citizens of the kingdom, but still on the way to the kingdom. And there is much of the journey yet ahead of us. And there is so much that it distresses us and disturbs us and distracts us in this life. Can we know for sure that we will one day indeed stand in glory as believers? Can we have any assurance in this life that we will indeed take possession of all of God's glorious promises and based on the Holy Scriptures and as it's summarized for us in the Canons of Dort, we say a resounding, yes, we can. And that's what we want to look at this afternoon, how we can find assurance that we will indeed uh, receive the inheritance that Christ has kept for us in Himself in heaven. Our theme, as we look at the Canons of Dort, uh, fifth head of doctrine, articles 9 to 11, our theme is this, God's people confess God's gracious assurance of their preservation unto salvation. God's people confess God's gracious assurance of their preservation unto salvation. We'll look in the first place at the knowledge of this assurance, the fact that we know this to be true, from the Bible, and in the second place, the basis of this assurance. But as we, God's people, confess God's gracious assurance of our preservation unto salvation, we see in the first place the knowledge of this assurance. And so we're saying that we can know 
that the Lord will preserve us to the end until the day when we will hear him say with his very voice to us, well done, good and faithful servant. Until the day, he will preserve us until the day when we will receive that crown of righteousness that is reserved for us in Christ Jesus. And Article 9 reminds us that believers may and do obtain assurance. Now, before we go any further, back up for the boys and girls, what again is a believer? What's a believer? Belie we say believers may and do obtain a, a assurance. What's a believer? Well, a believer is not simply a, a good person. It's not one who is trying very hard to make things right with God, trying to, to earn God's favor by doing all these good things. A believer is a person who truly and sincerely trusts in the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. A believer is one who possesses the Holy Spirit of Christ and by that Holy Spirit is able to confess Jesus is Lord. That's what a believer is. It's not just a matter of church membership or attendance. You can be a member of a church and still not be a believer. You could be uh, in, in Christian circles all your life and in the Christian community and still not uh, attain that very special place of being a believer. It's not about church membership or attendance. It's about being converted, which, which as we've said before, means a, a, a turning from sin, turning from the world, turning from, the, from indulging our old sinful nature, turning to the Lord Jesus Christ and following Him. It's about being converted and it's about being convicted that Jesus Christ is the only way of salvation. That's a believer. Now, we confess that believers may and do obtain assurance in this life. In other words, we may possess a knowledge that, to use the words of uh, Psalm 121, we may possess the knowledge that the Lord will not indeed allow my foot to be moved. That the Lord who keeps me does not slumber nor sleep, and so I cannot be lost we may obtain assurance and know in this life that the Lord our God is our keeper, that He will keep me. He is at the shade at my right hand. He shall preserve me from all evil. He shall preserve my soul. He shall preserve my going out and my coming in from this time forth and forevermore. This is the confident knowledge of the believer. Or we might think of uh, our scripture passage, Psalm 27, a psalm of great confidence and assurance penned by David under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, it expresses the comfort of the child of God who looks to him in danger, in great peril. David speaks of the wicked coming against him to eat up his flesh. And, and when we read that and we understand the, 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 the greater implications of it, we'll see, we say, well, which of us as Christians cannot relate to, to this, to this kind of a situation where you feel as if the, the wicked are coming against you to eat up your flesh? And the wicked in, in our lives can be, uh, maybe it's a physical illness. Maybe it's a disease that you are afflicted with, which is threatening to take your life or is sapping away your strength. Maybe it's enemies of a spiritual nature, temptations and sins that have the potential to destroy you. Doubt and fear can be enemies that, that anchor us to despair. There are times in our lives when our spiritual light is so dim, we wonder if it exists at all. Sometimes there are emotional struggles in our lives. Some of us struggle with depression, anxiety, and, and coming with this is a, is a feeling distant from God and, a guilt, and the guilt that comes with that. Feeling, as a lady told me one time, down in a hole with no idea how am I going to get out of this. There are enemies that attack us in this life. Satan is constantly nipping at our heels like a rabid dog. Our own sinful nature pulling us down again and again into discontent and discouragement. And yet the child of God continues to return to the knowledge of God's preservation. With all of this, we know that God will always hold us fast and keep us on the right path. According to the measure of our faith, we confess in the canons, believers surely believe that we will ever continue as true and living members of God's church and that we have the forgiveness of sins and life eternal. And now the authors of the canons uh, who showed great understanding of, of, uh, of, of humanity, the way we think and the struggles that we have as fallen human beings, they're careful to add according to the measure of their faith. And that's important because we understand as well that not every Christian is in the same place spiritually. As in life, there are spiritual babies in the church, 
those who are just learning the basics, very new to the faith, just coming to understand what this whole Christianity thing is about. There are young Christians who are wrestling at this time with, with what they have been taught and how that measures up against what the rest of, of life teaches. And then there are the more mature Christians who struggle, no doubt, but who are more steadfast in their assurance. Well, according to the measure of their faith, Christians, we confess, may indeed obtain assurance of their salvation that they may know in their heart of hearts that they indeed belong body and soul in life and in death to their faithful Savior, Jesus Christ, and they always will be. Think of how the Apostle Paul speaks in, in Philippians 1 verse 12, or 2 Timothy 1 verse 12. He says, I know that, my, that I, whom I have believed, and I'm persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed unto him until that day. He says, I know whom I have believed. He's persuaded uh, that, of God's preservation unto salvation. Or, or listen as well to the, to the confession of Job in uh, chapter 19, verses 25 to 27. This is, the, this is a believer confessing the knowledge of God's faithfulness. Uh, Job writes in Job 19, verse 25 and following, For I know that my Redeemer lives, and he shall stand at last on the earth. And after my skin is destroyed, this I know, that in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another, how my heart yearns within me. Well, listen as well to the author of Hebrews in chapter 10, verses 19 to 23. Again, expressing confidence uh, of the knowledge of God's faithfulness uh, so that we will persevere in our faith. Uh, Hebrews 10, verse 19 to 23, uh, he writes, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without, favoring, without wavering, for he who promised is faithful." He who promised is faithful. Or again, listen to David's confession in Psalm 27, verse 5. For in the time of trouble, he confesses of God. He shall hide me in his pavilion, in the secret place of his tabernacle. He shall hide me. He shall set me high upon a rock. Listen to verse 10. David says, when my father and mother forsake me, then the Lord will take care of me. And so... When we look at, listen to all of these Bible passages, and this is just a small sampling that express the, the, the confidence of God's people throughout the ages, the saints of all ages, who are very confident in their knowledge that God will preserve them so that they will persevere. But when we listen to, to some of these passages, we see that this doctrine of perseverance of the saints is not just some reformed doctrine. This is straight out of Scripture. The saints of times past believed and they knew that their salvation was secure, that God would preserve them to the very end. They possessed a faith that bore the blows of doubt and fear and even ongoing sin in their lives. But listen, we have to be reminded as well too, of, to, to use the words of the canons here, that this confidence comes with the measure of our faith, with the measure of our faith. We're reminded here that we, we grow more convinced of these things, of the surety of God's promises. We grow more convinced the more our faith grows. And so this is, uh, we need to take this as a word of, of encouragement. It needs to spur us on to be, uh, as, sec, uh, as Peter writes in 2 Peter 3.18, to be growing in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Every Christian should be growing in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ because the confidence comes with the measure of our faith. And so if we are still infants in the faith, don't be surprised that we struggle with these things as we grow in our knowledge of the Bible, in our knowledge of God and, and His power and His great love for us, uh, in the knowledge of His faithfulness that has been confessed by the, the saints throughout the ages, we are growing in our confidence as well. Uh, Paul uh, writes as well in Ephesians 3, verse 14 and following, that he bows his knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He writes this to the church in Ephesus. Why does he bow his knee to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ? 
that the Father would grant them growth in the knowledge of Christ, that they may be filled with the fullness of God. And so it's a process that needs to be moving forward. It needs to be progressing toward a greater uh, fullness of knowledge in God. It is as we grow to maturity in our faith that we more and more are convinced of the truth of our confession. We are grounded in the knowledge of the truth that we have, that is, we are in possession of the forgiveness of sins and life eternal. And this is not something we look forward to. This is not something we aspire to. It is ours now. We may know this. But how do we know that? And as we, God's people, confess God's gracious assurance of our preservation unto salvation, we want to see in the second place the basis of this assurance. In other words, upon what do we base our assurance that God will preserve us? Upon what do we base our assurance that God will preserve us? Article 10 reminds us that this assurance is not produced by any peculiar revelation contrary to or independent of the Word of God. Now, the word peculiar here is used in the older sense, uh, meaning um, special, private, uh, out of the ordinary, even uh, individual. And so what, what the canons are trying to say here is that uh, the assurance that we are God's children and that God will preserve us to the end in our faith is not a result of some kind of a special or private communication that God uh, does with us uh, individually. We do not become convinced, uh, say for instance, through a dream where God came to me in a dream and he told me this specifically. That's kind of out of the ordinary. Is that possible? Is it, uh, that, that this, this happens? Maybe. Uh, but uh, or, uh, ordinarily, God speaks to us in his word, not through dreams, not through visions as in Old Testament times, or some kind of special moving. Sometimes you hear of certain churches where people refuse to even come to the Lord's table until they have had some kind of a mystical experience. Or if you think of some of the charismatic churches today, the so-called uh, neo-Pentecostal ones, um, it's believed in, in circles like that that one must have a, an ecstatic uh, filling by the Spirit moment, including speaking in tongues to be regarded as a Christian. And throughout its history, and this is again uh, on the rise today in, in Christian circles, throughout it, its history the church has had to engage the heresy of what is called mysticism as well. And mysticism teaches that we either don't need the Bible or the law or that these are not enough because we are now led by the Holy Spirit. And that's a dangerous path to follow because it then leaves faith and life up to the individual. And instead of obeying the objective truth of God's Word, Christian life becomes subjective, which is based on uh, also basing my Christian life on what I feel and what I think and how I interpret, all along believing that I am led by the Holy Spirit. Well, in contrast to these, uh, what the canons call peculiar revelations, Article 10 lists three means by which we receive this assurance contained in God's Word. It says, and I quote, this assurance is not produced by a peculiar revelation besides or outside the Word, but by faith in the promises of God, which He has most abundantly revealed in His Word for our comfort. And so that's the first way. Second, by the testimony of the Holy Spirit, witnessing with our spirit that we are children and heirs of God. And finally, the third way, by the serious and holy pursuit of a good conscience and of good works. And let's look at these three in turn. The first way that we are assured that we are forgiven, that we have eternal life, that we will persevere in, uh, in this life is by faith in the promises of God. We believe the promises that God has made to us in His Word. If we don't believe it, we can't be assured, in other words, um, that uh, we will persevere in our faith or that we possess eternal life and the forgiveness of sins. Some examples of promises of God that we must believe in order to know that we possess eternal life. Think of John 3.16. Uh, everyone knows that. For God so loved the world that uh, He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. That's a promise that a believer may hold fast to, and it gives you that assurance, as you believe God's promise, that you will not be lost, that God will hold on to, uh, to you to the end. You shall not perish, but have eternal life if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Or think of Romans 8, verse 38 to 39, where we're told 
believers are told that nothing shall separate us from the love of God in Christ. Or think of the words of Jesus when he said of us, his sheep, no one can snatch them from my hand. Those are promises of God. And God does not break his promises because it's not his nature to break promises. He has established a covenant of grace with us and he has confirmed this covenant by giving us faith by his Holy Spirit and he has begun this wor good work in us and he always finishes what he starts. One of his characteristics, one of his attributes is what is called his immutability, his unchangingness. And so by faith, we are assured that God will always hold on to us no matter what may happen to us along the way, the ups and downs, the slips and stumbles of this life, along the pathway of life, God will always hold on to us. Why? Because we believe his promises and his promises never fail. And what God has promised, he will do. A second way we can be assured that we possess eternal life and forgiveness of sins and uh, that we will persevere in our faith is from uh, as the canons put it, from the testimony of the Holy Spirit, witnessing with our spirit that we are children and heirs of God. Now that's almost a, a direct quote, a straight quote from Romans 8, verses 14 to 17. Romans 8, 14 to 17. Listen to what it sounds like. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then ears, ears of God, and joint ears with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may be glorified together. And so the Holy Spirit comes to live in our hearts. And as he makes his home in our hearts, the way we view ourselves changes. When he is present in our hearts, we begin to see ourselves in a different way. No longer as children of darkness, no longer of children of the world, no longer as children who are outside of the covenant, aliens and strangers to God's grace. We begin to see ourselves as children of light. That is what the Spirit does in our hearts. We begin to see ourselves as adopted children of God. With amazement, we begin to see that while be before we were outside of God's gracious love, now we are loved by Him, we are His children. And we can begin to pray with all honesty, our Father who art in heaven. And we, we can begin to look to Him in trust and dependence and believing that He is working all things together for our good. And we begin to take comfort in His tender fatherly care. And so a second way that we can be assured of eternal life and forgiveness and, and that we will persevere is through the testimony of the Holy Spirit, what he does in our hearts, the changes that he brings into our lives. A third way, uh, according to the canons, as it summarizes scriptural teaching for us, a third way that we can be assured of forgiveness of sins and eternal life and that we will persevere in our faith is from something that all true Christians possess, which is a serious and lasting desire to preserve a good conscience and to perform good works. Yes, Christians sin, sometimes terribly. But true Christians, genuinely converted Christians, are always repentant. There is godly sorrow in our hearts that we have violated God's law when we do. We are saddened when we have trespassed against him, when we know that we have done that. Our consciences accuse us when we sin against God. And so we strive as much as possible to preserve a clear conscience before God. And we try to avoid what displeases him. And we're quick when we sin to confess our sins and to seek his help to avoid sin in the future. And that is what separates God's children from the children of the world. That's how we know that we will persevere in our faith, that we are possessors of eternal life and that we are forgiven because there is that, con uh, that conscience that nags at us and we are striving to preserve a good conscience before God. And so we know we are children of God because our conscience bothers us, we are repentant and we confess our sins, we go to God for help. And we also see in ourselves a desire to perform good works, says the canons. Now this again is not a performing of good works in order to gain salvation, it is not doing good works in order to keep ourselves in God's good favor. 
It's doing good works out of gratitude or thankfulness. And actually, if we are honest with ourselves and we know what the Bible teaches, we know that we only produce good fruit for God because he has made us, by his Spirit, good trees. But by his Spirit, we, seek the, we do good works. We seek the good of others. We pray for and with those who are facing challenges in life. We give counsel to our neighbor. We do whatever our hands find to do to bring glory to our Father. Those are just a few examples of, of good works that then we, we, we then begin to produce. And by, as we see these things in ourselves, we know and we are assured that we are living members of Christ's church, that we are forgiven of our sins and that we possess eternal life. And that God, who has given us faith and is doing these good works in and through us, that he will bless us with faithfulness and perseverance so that we will indeed finish the race and keep the faith to the very end. Now, that's not to say that we as believers are always confident of our salvation. We know from life experience that that is just not true. And Article 11, again, being very realistic, and again, showing great understanding of human nature, Article 11 reminds us of the reality that believers in this life struggle with various carnal doubts and that under grievous temptations, they do not always feel this full assurance of faith and certainty of persevering. And by carnal doubts here is meant uh, the struggles that we have in life because we are still in the flesh. And the flesh, we know, as we've said before, the flesh is prone to sin. It's pulled in the direction of sin. The flesh is weak, and it makes us inconsistent in walking the Christian walk. And so we look at ourselves, and what we see quite often, we see weakness, we see failings in ourselves, we look at ourselves, if we're honest with ourselves, when we have those moments of great honesty, we look at ourselves, we see a great lack of love for our neighbor and indeed a great, a great love for ourselves instead. We, see, we even see sometimes how ungrateful we are to what God, how unthankful we are. I mean, think about this. Quite often we pray for things, and we pray for things, and we pray for things, and we plead with God in, in great dependence upon Him. And when God blesses us, and we, we, we receive the, the fruit of our prayers, how much do we actually pray uh, or give thanks to God? How ungrateful are we uh, uh, quite often? When we look at ourselves quite often, we see how unrepentant we are. Quite often, we look at ourselves, we look at the sin of, in our lives, and we wonder if we are really children of God sometimes. And we ask ourselves questions like, if I was a true Christian, I wouldn't do things like this. Or how could a, a Christian sin in this way? How could a sanctified person be tempted in this way or do or say or think such unsanctified things? How, could I, how is it possible that I am a Christian on the one hand and indulge in my sinful nature to such a great extent, such a, a horrific extent? But let us remember, by the way, that uh, on the one hand, first of all, it, it's, it's because we are so sinful and so inconsistent that we, had, we needed a Savior to come to die on the cross for us. And secondly, when we see sin in ourselves, let us also remember that we are not the first. And we are not the only ones, we are not the only Christians in the world who see sin in ourselves. We all see it. One example, Asaph in Psalm 73. He speaks of his foot slipping. That is, there was a, some kind of a spiritual stumble in his life. And so he confesses, he says that at one time, my foot slipped. He speaks of him, himself envying the proud. He was looking at, the, at the, the, the wicked of the world, how they had grown wealthy and they were healthy, and he begins to envy them. And he begins to wonder, have I wasted my time giving to God so much, giving my life to God? Have I washed my hands in innocence for nothing? Have I cleansed myself for nothing? Maybe it's just as good that I, I'm just like the wicked of the world because here they are, not knowing God, not believing in God, and yet they're doing well. Asaph in Psalm 73 confessed this spiritual stumbling in himself, and all Christians can relate to this. But here's our comfort. The Lord, our God, our Savior God, who is ever faithful, will never allow us to be tempted or fall into sin to, to the point where we will lose our salvation. He will always provide a means of escape. He will always provide a, a means of restoration and reconciliation to himself. He will always seek us, search for us, take hold of us, draw us back. His hand always remains upon us. His shepherd's crook 
always remains above us, his chosen children. He will preserve us so that we will persevere. And by his spirit, he reminds us every day that he is and always will be our light and our salvation. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we may confess, among so many other things, your faithfulness, that it may bring us such great assurance that you will, having saved us, not let us go astray. You will never allow us to be lost, never to be snatched away or to wander away. You are our good shepherd who seeks and keeps us, your sheep. Thank you that we may possess knowledge of your faithfulness and of your preservation of us unto salvation, that we may know even in this life, even though we slip and we stumble so often, that you will never allow us to fall away. And thank you, Father, for the ways and the means by which we may be assured through believing your promises in the Holy Scriptures, through the testimony of the Holy Spirit in our hearts, through the witness of our own conscience and our desire to do good works in this life. Thank you for these things that constantly give us a tap on the shoulder reminding us that we are children of God and we always will be. Thank you, thank you that you are our light and our salvation. Indeed, Father, whom shall we fear? In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's return to number 48 in our hymnals. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Jehovah is my light, and let's rise to sing the last two stanzas, stanzas four and five of number 48 is our song of response. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that we may once again bring to you our offerings and recognize that this too is an act of worship. We thank you that we may give to what the work of the voice of the martyrs this afternoon. We thank you for the information that they bring to us and we once again pray that you would bless their work and also bless those who suffer so greatly for the cause of Christ in many lands. Bless us as we give to what the furtherance of your kingdom and to be a blessing to your children everywhere. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
that's wise. Congregation, as we go forward into the week ahead, lift up your hearts to heaven and receive the Lord's blessing as we part. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit be and abide with you all. Amen. Our doxology is number 491.